Hello, Wanderers. I am so excited to be joined by Dr. Audra Walsh today. Um, as I told many of you that we would have this blessing of welcoming her to answer some of our questions and concerns. Welcome, Dr. Walsh. How are you? Great, Shannon. Thanks for having me so much. I have so many fond memories with you and at the Wonder Studio with my own kiddos. I just, I'm so thrilled to be here. Not so thrilled at the circumstance, but happy to be connecting again um, in, in spite of it all. Yes, yes. We're, I'm so happy that um, as I, we had a phone call yesterday where we kind of talked about some of what we might talk about here today. But um, so I'll just say this story again. At the other night, I was reading through some of my clients' questions and going through some textbooks and realizing that there are no perfect answers to give people on what to do in a quarantine situation like we're in. And so, so I thought. I don't have to figure this out by myself. We can reach out to other professionals and work together to get through this team to still provide services to our clients and support and um, hopefully a sense of humor about this whole situation. Um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do? What are the services you provide? Absolutely. So I have the the fortune of knowing um, many folks in the community and um, working with some of your wonders in the past as well. Um, I am a licensed clinical psychologist specializing in pediatric psychology. I'm also a uh, nationally certified school psychologist. And prior to um, going back into psychology, I was a uh, um, uh, an educator in New York City public schools. Yay! And, uh, and, um, and specialized in teaching students with um, diverse learning needs, so learning disabilities, um, those that are on the autism spectrum, as well as typical learners, if there is such thing right. as, as a typical learner. Um, so, so in the practice that I currently have, it's, a, it's an independent practice here in St. Petersburg, Florida, in the Tyrone area. Um, we offer services to families throughout the state of Florida. Um, we work <coughs> a lot of work with early childhood, so really supporting families on challenging behaviors, um, big emotions, helping kids to learn to cope and regulate their behaviors or emotions, um, helping to um, helping families assist families using evidence-based strategies to apply to their own lives, whether it's going on vacation, hey, let's try to tone down some tantrums, let's help kids adjust to a new school. Um, so we're, we are already in practice of taking these evidence-based strategies and applying them to, um, to unique families' needs. And now we're faced with how do we take these strategies and apply them you know, globally for families that are, you know, including my own, that are learning how to not just survive, but thrive in yeah. this time of social distancing. And let me tell you from my own experience, it doesn't happen overnight. <laughs> so um, I hear that. <laughs> is, the expectation is not that we're doing this amazingly or perfectly, but that we are, you know, that we're aware and that we're working toward having a growth experience through this very challenging crisis. Um, so in addition to the, the early childhood work that we do, we provide cognitive behavioral therapy for youth, for teens, young adults, and for parents and adults. Um, we also do um, a, a type of therapy called um, parent-child interaction therapy, PCIT, which is a phenomenal program for really strengthening that parent-child relationship and improving compliance, reducing tantrums, even decreasing anxiety. So, um, so we have a lot to offer the community, both before COVID-19 and now absolutely after, afterwards. And we have all of our um, services are offered remotely now via telehealth. Thank goodness. 
Um, I love what you said about getting through this time, not just in survival mode, but in a way that we can thrive. And, you know, of course we want to be careful about not putting too much pressure on ourselves. I totally agree, but I, I love some of the memes that are going around about how our kids might remember this time versus how we might remember this time. And I know yesterday we talked about um, sort of reining in our own narrative and the narrative that we create for those in our families and those that we're um, interacting with, even if it is through Zoom sessions or FaceTiming or grandparents and being careful with that narrative um, or maybe not careful, but mindful of, of what the, the narrative is. Yeah, Shannon, I think, and I've been doing even more thinking on that topic since we spoke yesterday, but, you know, when we have this situation, COVID-19, social distancing, quarantine, flattening the curve, it is anxiety producing. I think anyone with a heartbeat <laughs> is yeah. feeling. Yeah. Um, and, and we all have our own narrative. We all have our own thoughts and worries. And what mine might be are likely some the same, some different from yours. And um, each of your wonder parents might have their own set of worries and concerns. And in a situation like this, it's very easy to get stuck in some of those worries, worry about what is the next month going to entail? What is the next two months going to entail? How are my kids going to cope? Will they, you know, what are the academic or social implications for them. Um, these are all thoughts that I'd be lying to if I said I didn't have them myself. Right. Um, but I think the, you know, what we know from cognitive behavioral therapy and what we, I think we all can um, say, yeah, we're experiencing now. If we allow ourselves to be stuck in those thoughts, they can get very dark and very consuming. But when we recognize that narrative, oh, okay, I'm concerned about my child's social development. And rather than- I'm getting that oh, question yeah. a lot. <laughs> yes, uh, you, we both have. <laughs> and, and we're thinking about it for our own kids. Of course. Um, and, and for ourselves. <laughs> and for ourselves, right? And so, so I think when we, when we recognize that narrative and then we are kind to ourselves and we don't beat ourselves up for having those thoughts or having those concerns because it's a normal part of the process, but then, you know, kind of thanking them. Okay. Thank you for bringing this to my awareness, but I'm not going to get stuck with these thoughts. What can I do? How can I take this concern and turn it into something productive? I'm concerned about social development what can I do now that can help solve for that? So some of these anxieties that we're all having are very adaptive. You know, they're keeping us home. They're keeping us socially distanced. They're, um, and they're also causing many, many people to find very creative solutions to some of these challenges that we now experience that were not part of our lives two weeks ago. I love that. You know, I have said for years, because people will say to me, you're so creative, you're so creative. And I'm like, you know what? Everyone is creative. It's just about putting your ener energy towards that source. And I think that you're so right. This time can be an opening for everyone to sort of reach in and find that creativity inside. And it's, yeah. it can be a probably have a lot of the answers either for their own, you know, worries, anxieties, or challenges for themselves or for each other. And so I think that's, you know, if we're talking about silver linings is the way that our community has come together and continues to come together to support one another and share I creative problem solving ideas that are working in each person's home. Um, and, and I'm happy to share ideas that I have, but I'm sure that your wonders have, you know, even, you know, even better ideas that are even more tailored to their family's current needs. And I would love to hear those. Maybe we can get a thread going on, you know, what people are doing. 
I love that. So maybe when we post this on Facebook, we can hope that they'll comment with some ideas of creativity that, um, that they have implemented in their homes. I know that you have been implementing a lot of creative ideas at your house, but um, I know also that you kind of developed a, a top seven list or a top you know, few things that we can do right away that might um, that might just help ground us all in where we can start um, this this new adventure that we're all on. Uh, sure, sure. I'd love to read some of those. Yeah, so this is my right now. It's actually up to eight, my top eight, ah. <laughs> and it's growing uh, <laughs> by hour. <laughs> That's good. Uh, before before I go over these, I think my uh, attorney friends would ah. And if I didn't give a little um, disclosure or disclaimer, and that is that this conversation that we're having is um, is not meant to be medical advice. It's between right. you and me, and um, and we're sharing ideas, and it's meant for educational purposes only. If anyone listening to this has any concerns, they're encouraged to talk with their medical provider or to give you know a licensed mental mental health provider a ring. And, um, and we're happy, my office and my team is happy to field some of those calls and questions. At the end, will you just sort of maybe just briefly go over how a person might recognize if it's a little more heightened mm -hmm. than just what the, this is such a new experience for all of us. Like we're all, like you said in the beginning, having this kind of baseline anxiety and fears how do we know or begin to see when that's going up maybe a little bit above the threshold? Getting into the clinical range, right? So yeah. um, it's in a situation like this, I'm expecting everyone to have at risk or, you know, clinic, subclinical and even breaking into the clinical range of anxiety um, at one point or another. I think sure. the question is, is it enduring? Is it, a, is it a moment or, you know, a half of a day or even a whole day of feeling really stuck in worry or, you know, depressive thoughts? Or is it enduring where it's lasting one week, two weeks, interfering and paralyzing a person from, you know, doing the things that they need or want to do? Right. Um, those are, you know, that's where it gets into the clinical range where we would say, yeah, absolutely reach out for help. But I'm also, you know, of the mindset that prevention is the best medicine. So I feel, and, and I am so fortunate and grateful to have the background that I do. I feel like um, the, the strategies and the coping mechanisms that we put in place now can be really protective for, you know, future either future um, development or future decline. That doesn't mean that if, you know, if you're in a place that you really need help now, that um, you're doing something wrong or you haven't been doing preventions because right. everyone is coping and handling things differently and processing at a different speed and rate. So I encourage everyone to reach out to uh, just kind of take your mental health temperature and, to, and yeah. to just make sure that you have enough skills and strategies in your tool belt um, for the great mountain that we're all climbing together, right? So for me personally, um, I, may, I do, and this is going to sound cliche, because self-care is such a hot topic right now, but self-care you know, we always say self-care is vital, put on your own oxygen mask before you put on your kids, you know, when you fly. But that couldn't be more important than now. Yes. And I would recommend, and I know we talked about self-care yesterday and how you're continuing to do your self-care routine. I you love self-care. <laughs> but I would say that guilt has no belonging there. Put it away on a shelf because it is vital that the caregivers and that the heads of the home are taking care of their mental health. 